Whatever you say, say nothing when you talk about you know what. For if you know should hear you, you know what you'll get. They'll take you off to you know where, and you wouldn't know how long. So for you know who's sake, don't let anyone hear you singing this song. This first person film, set in the 1950s, reminds us how Catholic grammar schools insisted on blind obedience. The system was a bully, thriving on parents and children being shamed into silence. The author's answer was resistance, mocking his tormentors as the twisted paper tigers they were. Starting as early as five years old, he fought against their unfairness and found standing up for yourself was its own reward. But those powers insisted on whatever you say, say nothing. My first fight was with a guy way above my weight class, more than 100 pounds. I was five years old. He was 40. I was a skinny malink, a tall drink of water. They said, he looks just like his father. Will I be fat like him? I wisecracked. Offended, my father socked me in the skull. There was thunder and lightning and rumbling in my eyes and the smell of ammonia in my nose. My five-year-old legs wobbled, but I would not go down. Not that I thought I could win, but I refused to go down. As my mom often said, there's no sense being Irish if you're not going to be stubborn. Events like these stick out like painful peaks in the humdrum daily slaps and natural shocks the flesh was heir to in my Sullivan clan. Without warning, my father would grab me from behind and tap my head on our brick fireplace as if he was playing with me like a cat plays with a mouse he's about to dispatch. My oldest brother Richie recalled he also picked on the same weak spots over and over, violently squeezing my scrawny neck or my collarbone or flicking my forehead with his finger, which felt like a club. When I was eight, I was still under 100 pounds, I was sitting in our family ritual, a semicircle of seven kids on the floor watching TV. I made a wisecrack about something on the tube. As my fellow siblings' tittering subsided, a baritone growl rose from my father's recliner. Terrence! Evidently, the censor was offended. Go to bed! What could my eight-year-old mind have come up with that so offended my father? I obediently rose, but quickly added, picky, picky, as if to say, it's just a joke. Again, my siblings tittered, that chuckling in church kind of laughter. Amid the tittering, the ominous sound, kalump, the thumping footrest on the recliner. He erupted like an Irish Catholic volcano, spewing rage and lava all over the room. My six siblings disappeared in the smoke, floating on molten flows. Perched on the first step of the stairs, lava lapping at my feet, I choked on the smoke, roiling off the ceiling and filling the room as it gushed from my father's ears. Burns! He flew across the room on Old Testament archangel wings, Frederick Church clouds tumbling behind him, cumulus nimbusly. As he landed on top of me, he struck me with a thunderclap shot to my forehead. My skull bounced off the stairs. I put up the Floyd Patterson peekaboo defense, 
fists and forearms against your head and your chest, crying out loud, I don't care how much you hit me, I'm not crying. A short pause was followed by a volley of body shots with his big bony hands, and all I did was grunt. He stopped with a slap to the right temple, which I rolled with and ran up the stairs. I did not cry. I'm not crying anymore. That was the first time I said those words, and they became a credo for the rest of my life. I will resist. You will not crush me. And don't try to make an example out of me. It will backfire on you like a firecracker that goes off in your hand. All of my stories are about resisting people abusing power and proving you can resist and win those battles for yourself. I gladly paid the price for my resistance because my payback was standing up for myself and saying, you don't have to cower. These people are paper tigers. I prove this in every one of my stories. Fight back against people abusing power against you. You will live to laugh and write and sing about it. While working with Pete Seeger for more than two decades, we agreed everyone owns the right to be treated fairly, with dignity. We would often sing about it with this song. My life flows on in endless song Above earth's lamentations I hear the real, though far off hymn That hails a new creation No storm can shake my inmost calm While to that rock I'm clinging, since love is Lord of heaven and earth. How can I keep from singing when tyrants tremble in their fear and hear their death knell ringing, when friends rejoice both far and near? How can I keep from singing? In prison cell and dungeon vile, Our thoughts to them are winging, When friends by shame are undefiled. How can I keep from singing? How can I keep from seeing? We're in Hicksville hubcap stealing capital of Long Island. Here behind me is St. Ignatius Grammar School, where I was sentenced to eight years. When I was very young, my brother James, had, uh, who was in first grade at the time, had done something horrendous like uh, chewing gum in class. Well, the nun who was presiding over the class decided to punish him by putting him in a waste paper basket. She then commanded that all of the Sullivans in the school over the intercom system report to her classroom. When all of the Sullivans showed up, five of my brother's sisters and about, oh, some 20-odd strangers, they were told to say their respective goodbyes to James as he was being sent to China in a waste paper basket for being a bad boy. Now this is just the psychological side of the teaching methods used. The standard method used by nuns for getting a student out of his chair 
was called the hairlet. Firmly grabs the child by the sideburns. Lifts. Sister Kevin's Cooler. Sister Kevin had a cooler at the top of the stairs, in the darkness, in the wings of the ancient auditorium. It had 30-foot tall ceilings and a 50 by 200-foot hall. When you climbed the spiral staircase, it smelled of dry wood and dust that had not been swept in decades. When you got to the top, you were 25 feet above the stage floor of that hall, facing the rigging that pulled a 50-foot wide curtain across the stage. A heavy, dark, purple velvet wall, a color made for Easter Mass, or a vestment for a 90-foot tall priest. The cooler was a threat at the ready. Any day, for the slightest misbehavior, you would have to climb the stairs, a tight cast iron spiral that stood behind the door, beside the door, to our sixth grade classroom. We 12-year-olds were there to learn and to pray that Sister Kevin didn't take you up there. The cooler was Sister Kevin's concoction, a steel milk box in the dark, at the top of the stairs. All she would say was, rise, Mr. Sullivan, and point to the door, and you knew what to do. One morning, it was my turn. I had been there before for a joke or some silly transgression. Knowing the drill, I rose for the beating I knew would be mine. Without thinking, I climbed into the dark, to the top of the stairs, and as usual, she said, bear your behind. I let my pants and my underwear fall to my knees. I smelled that nun smell, soap and stiff cotton muslin fresh from the ironing. She was draped all over me as she bent me over with the palm of her hand on my shoulder blade. She first slapped my bare buttocks with her hand two or three times to soften it for the yardstick attack she was winding up for. After whacking my butt with the stick four or five times, the tip of the stick hit my testicles. I let out a yell heard all over that school. It echoed all over the old auditorium. No more, I screamed as I lifted the milk box up in the air and threw it away. It took forever to clatter on the floor of the stage below. The milk box of the 50s was a little steel cage. It dented the hard wood stage. The pain was still throbbing at the back of my balls. As I pulled up my pants and went down to the boys' room, I grabbed the brown paper towel and soaked it with water, dropped my trousers, and plastered my parts. That hurt even more. I grasped for air as my groin throbbed. I threw the paper towel in the trash, grabbing at my pants, stumbling out into the hallway, but not back to class. I went to the nurse, who said I needed permission to see the nurse from Sister Kevin. I'm not going back there. I'll see Mother Adelaide. I said as I walked out the door, ignoring the nurse. Mother Adelaide was already waiting outside in the hallway. 
and took me back inside to the nurse. She said, See what you can do to make him feel better. Terence, we'll talk later. Take a rest now. Mother Adelaide said, I knew she would be on my side. What Sister Kevin did was not right. And Mother Adelaide was one of those rare grown-ups who cared when I got in trouble. She must have known about the cooler, but I don't think she knew about the details until I told her. I don't remember anyone else being sent to the cooler for the rest of that year. The cooler was usually a beating for bad boys, and bad boys did not complain. They'd been convinced by everybody it was their fault. They didn't complain to their parents because another beating would follow at home, sometimes a more severe one. You didn't talk about school beatings unless the note was sent home to explain just how bad you had been. The yardstick attack in the cooler always seemed out of whack with the deed you'd done. Sister Kevin seemed to be looking for an excuse to take you up there. And after all, you were a bad boy at home and at school, and nobody listens to bad boys. You can hit them all you want and get away with murder, or worse. Many years later, when retelling this tale to a woman friend of mine, she said, you tell this story like there's no sexual angle here. You were 12 years old, and she has you dropping your trousers, spanking your bare butt, where she can see your genitals? I replied, well, she was a nun. I sure wasn't thinking about having sex with her. After that year, I was not in Sister Kevin's class. We had Sister John Michael from Ireland, and she was much tougher. You were taught never to talk about the punishments they gave you. That was the hallmark of the 1950s. Nobody said nothing, which reminds me of another repressive Catholic state in Belfast, where this ditty comes from. Whatever you say, say nothing. Written by Colm Sands, who gave me permission to sing it for you. Whatever you say, say nothing. When you talk about you know what, for if you know should hear you, you know what you'll get. They'll take you off to you know where, and you wouldn't know how long. So for you know who's sake, don't let anyone hear you singing this song. Sister John Michael. It was the first day of seventh grade. And we heard our new teacher was one tough cookie, an Irish to boot. I took my usual seat in the back of the class. I was a class clown, and you can do your best work from the safety of the back of the room. When Sister John Michael arrived, she made quite an entrance. At six foot, she was the tallest nun we ever saw, and she never walked but flew with the black and white vestments billowing in her wake. She stood half a head above most of us 13-year-olds. Wiry she was. She looked like she'd break your face if you crossed her. She banked a turn around the front of the room, her habit flowing like a mainsail in a gale, until she docked herself at the desk, plopping an old leather book bag next to her seat. She unstrapped it and pulled out a big black ledger for attendance. I am Sister John Michael, she said. You little creatures are going to learn your lessons well this year and behave or else. I swear I heard her chuckle on the end of that short speech, reminiscent of, I'll get you my pretty and your little dog too. I may be making that up, I, as my memory of things 50 years old may be factitious. She went about the mechanical recitation of the students' names 
as they replied, Present! When she got to the end of the S's, a wicked smile cracked her stern face. Sullivan! Terence Michael! Where are you? She said she hadn't spoken to anybody else, and she was near the end of the alphabet. When she saw where I was, she said, Oh, no, dear, that won't do at all, at all. She pointed to a straight-A student who had opted for the seat right next to the teacher and said, You there, up, and trade seats with Terence. When I gathered up my stuff and reached the seat at the front of the class, she grabbed my chin and pushed it up, fixing her intense blue eyes to mine. Terence, this is the year you're going to behave. Do I have your undivided attention? Yes, sister. I replied, that's grand. You'll not be the black sheep in my class. You will behave and like it. She put me in a headlock, my face against her right breast, and playfully wrapped my skull with her bony knuckles. That's for nothing. Don't test my patience. Yes, sister, I said meekly. Sit, she barked. You and I are going to be fast friends, Mr. Sullivan. And you are going to behave. I was stunned. That nun smell was all over me. Hot, fresh ironing and soap. And she had my number. It dawns on me now, 50 years later, the convent was a network of women that live and work together. They are certainly going to warn a newly arrived nun about a wild child like me who hits back when he thinks he's being hit too much or too hard. Every day started with the headlock and the well-placed bony digits whacking my skull. Come on, she asked, and she taught me to reply, Come on. Come on is Irish for all right. What she taught me was, this was a mock question. After she hits me, what she's saying is, have I got your attention with these taps on your skull? My gama was saying, I got it. She called me many variations of my little blue-eyed devil, crazy devil, and wild boy. Once she told me not to test her with my eyes. That reminds me of an army drill sergeant who once scolded me. Don't you eyeball me, boy. I couldn't help it. I was asking him a question and I have big eyes. I guess he wanted me to make my eyes smaller in his presence. My first report card in the year of Sister John Michael was my best since first grade. She got my attention and I started studying out of fear of something stronger than the daily noogies. My grades got better, but the headlocks did not let up. Tough love before it was even coined. She knew I could improve, and proving her right gave her an affection for me that she would not admit until years later. And she did not admit that affection to me, but to my sister, who was also a nun in the same Dominican order. You could say I was the teacher's pet, but I had a short leash and a tight choker. Learn and behave, we were reminded daily. Come on. The missing report cards. The report cards were missing. It made no sense to Sister John Michael. She had all the grades in her master book back in the convent, and the cards were just copies. She tore the desk apart because they must be there. That morning, the class had gone to the cavernous assembly hall, whose 30-foot-tall ceilings made it seem high enough for a planetarium. 
It was also the site of an eerie monthly ritual. The enormous room lit by light blue discs hovering every 20 feet. They were intense examination lamps to detect lice on our heads. And everyone in the school had their turn under the blue light. As the nurse tossed your hair back and forth with a fine tooth comb. I don't remember anyone finding any lice, but they wouldn't tell children that in those days anyway. When all the kids were checked, they rolled away those light stands and we sat down to a movie. Always a religious one. The Passion of Christ, the Miracle of Fatima, etc., etc. It was when we returned to class, Sister John Michael noticed the report cards were not where she thought she left them, in her top drawer. A knock on the class door interrupted her search. It was the custodian with a galvanized bucket. He showed Sister the contents, and she dumped them into her wastebasket. They whispered back and forth. He told her these ashen remains were found in the school's incinerator, an ancient way of burning your garbage. She thanked him, closing the dark, stained oak door, and addressed the class. One of you is an arsonist and a vandal, her thick Irish accent ringing in our fearful ears. Sister John Michael was a no-nonsense disciplinarian and at six foot tall could easily manhandle any of our strongest 13-year-old seventh grade boys. She said, I will pass this bin about the room. All of you will see what became of our missing report cards. And one of you will tell us why they were set afire. She had already put two and two together and recalled only one person leaving her sight in the time the cards were missing. And that person had failed every subject on that card. The waste paper basket made its way from hand to hand, all the shocked pupils dilating with surprise until it came to Walter Farrell, who shot a brief look at it and started to pass it on. Oh no, Mr. Farrell, you're forgetting something, aren't you? She grabbed his right sideburn and twisted as it lifted him out of his seat. He squirmed, flinching in pain. You forgot to tell everyone who has done this vandalism. I don't know, Susie. He started to say as she twisted him sideways with a death grip on his sideburn and walked him out of the classroom door ahead of her. <laughs> Thumping and slapping and bumping against the thick plaster wall. We could all hear the pummeling through the wall. It lasted 15 minutes, an eternity for all concerned. The dark door swung open and Walter walked in first to a gasp from the whole class. His eyes were blackened, his nose bloodied, and his lip was split. I did it. I, I threw them in the incinerator, he said, as Sister John Michael stood behind him, her arms folded under the starched, stiff scapula of her habit. Mr. Sullivan, take Mr. Farrell to the nurse. Tell her he should go home. We all figured he would get another beating when he got home looking like that, especially if he complained about how the nun beat him. We never saw Walter in class again. He was sent to public school where we all wanted to go, but we were afraid to ask. Whatever you say, say nothing. Whatever you say, say nothing. When you talk about you know what, for if you know should hear you, you know what you'll get. 
They'll take you off to you know where, and you wouldn't know how long. So for you know who's sake, don't let anyone hear you singing this song.